WISC TV now presents For the Record. We've reached a milestone. First time, the first time in our nation's history that a woman will be a major party's nominee. We're talking politics next on For the Record. Thanks for joining us. I'm Neil Heinen. The major party presidential nominations are locked up or not. The Republican and Democratic conventions are a little more than a month away. Television ads for Wisconsin congressional races have begun. Down ticket races are shaping up and it's time for the senior members of our WISC election team to shake the rust off. We're talking electoral politics with the executive director of the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign, Matt Rothschild, and partner in the consulting firm, the Capital Group, Brandon Scholes. All right, guys, this is the, the beginning of the run-up. Here we go. Primary's over. Um, it's time. It's time to kind of try to make some sense of this. Uh, and I just, <laughs> I just want to start with your best, you know, kind of, Prediction, I guess, of the atmosphere at the convention, the the, the surety of the process. Um, uh, Brandon, I mean, what what do you what do you expect? Is this? Do we know the Republican nominee? You know, we've seen lots of pundits fall with their projections of what's going to happen. So this isn't the best year to be projecting, but some things have started to settle down. So I think. There was concern that the Republican convention would be this floor fight with bloody nose. It's not going to be that way. It's a Trump coronation. Mm -hmm. I think with that, though, there is a... It's not quite at the hype that you would want to see conventions at because of the coronation. I think it's not going to be at the hype because there is still not complete engagement and support for the Republicans nominee and I don't think by July that's going to change a whole lot mm -hmm. so uh, you know and you can gauge some of this by how well the conventions do with the revenue that they expect to generate from sponsorships and advertising right. all sorts of stuff and it's down right so it, it'll be there you'll people will watch it and, and, and read about it but I don't think it will come with the same sort of uh, you know, get up and go and motivation for the base party and others that you've seen in years past. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody thought this was even a possibility at the Democratic convention, Matt, until the last few weeks uh, when the Sanders campaign seemed, again, to be digging their heels in a little bit about uh, about um, turning over the reins to, to Hillary Clinton. I think it's going to happen, though. I think Bernie Sanders is getting used to the fact that uh, he's not going to be the nominee of the Democratic Party. I think he's got a ways to go to bring some of his supporters along with him. I think he was right not to uh, try to do that on uh, the night of the California primary because I don't think his people are ready. Uh, and he probably wasn't ready yet. But he's going to get ready. He did say that night that he'll do everything he can to stop Donald Trump from being president of the United States. And he said uh, the American people are not going to elect a bigot to be president of the United States. And I think he's right about that. Can he, though, can, can he do enough to ensure that his supporters at the convention don't raise issues about superdelegates, don't, you know, just make it a, a more contentious convention than Hillary Clinton would like? Well, there's going to be contention on those issues, and I think there should be. I think the superdelegate setup in the Democratic Party is absurd for a party that calls itself the Democratic Party. <laughs> And uh, I think on the platform he's going to have some, some uh, arm wrestling. And I think that's all to the good. They need to hash that out. But I think there will be unanimity uh, in Philadelphia for Hillary Clinton. I think there'll be a lot of enthusiasm. You saw some of that enthusiasm on Tuesday night when she uh, basically declared herself the presumptive nominee of the party. And I think that will give her some momentum. And I think she's going to need that momentum. But the safe money's on Hillary. I think the safe money was always on Hillary. Mm -hmm. And I think she's well positioned right now. Is it going to be worth even talking about who's not at the Republican convention, Brandon? I mean, right now, every governor or member of Congress who says, I'm not going, um, gets their, you know, their news cycle. Yeah, I think they get a news cycle. I think they get a story, I think, in the overall scheme of things, because this will be built and played as a coronation for Donald Trump. Uh, if somebody doesn't show up, it's a story, but it doesn't have a major impact. I, I think the challenge of this convention is going to be to manage the candidate 
and to keep them on a teleprompter and kind of make the convention look like conventions are supposed to look. What is yet to be determined is, of those who don't show up or those who do, what will they say in their speeches at the different points along the convention and what sort of issues will be brought up. You know, if, if state conventions are any uh, predictor of what might happen, there was not a lot said about Donald Trump at some of these places. So that's one that you're going to kind of watch to see how it plays out. Yeah. I mean, well, before the show's over, we're going to talk about down ticket races and we're going to talk about the, the legislative and congressional races. But, you know, I just want to make sure I get all of your wisdom on, on, you know, exactly what this means for the Republican Party, whether it's portrayed as reluctance or not, whether it's portrayed as anybody but Hillary or not. Um, what is the storyline here, here, Brandon, that the Republican Party ended up with Donald Trump as its candidate when it had this list of seemingly really qualified candidates for governor, and all of a sudden there's this feeling of buyer's remorse? Yeah, I think both parties coughed up a hairball on this. I mean, this is not what you're going to see are the, the candidates and, and both sides that are what you would, what you would expect. Same, and on the Republican side, uh, you know, they have uh, a completely different political year, unlike any time in history, with all the candidates they had, all the qualifications that came forth, and this is what they have as their nominee. And, you know, they can, they can push people as they want, but this guy is all about ego, and this is all about him. And there's no, you know, typically in campaigns, you talk about managing risk, uh, putting the best plans forward, making sure you stay on message and in this case that that doesn't exist with the Trump campaign I mean it's it's a moving target and the expectation that that the Republican base will will stick with their candidate I, I, I'm not so sure you know in, in targeting you they look to get 92 93 95 percent of the base party vote I, both candidates may be struggling for 80 you know and it's not that I, I don't believe those people who don't vote for their candidate, Trump or Clinton, are going to stay home. I think they'll come vote for down party tickets. They may walk from that particular checking a box. They may write somebody in. They may write for a third party candidate. But I think that top of the ticket is a much different equation this cycle that we have ever seen ever before and may never see again. I want to, I want to talk about the, the Democratic perspective on this and really what this says about America in 2016, which, which may be the most important thing, and we'll do that when we come back right after this. I'm back with the WISC election panel as we start our, our trip, our journey to November uh, with uh, uh, Brandon Scholes and Matt Rothschild. And I'm, you know, I, I'm still trying to paint a picture of, um, of of the of the candidacies and how they happened and what it says about us, Matt. And um, the, the idea that I, you know, even demographically, the the age of the two candidates that the Democrats um, chose, the, uh, the 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 kind of traditional political backgrounds, uh, seems to fly in the face of what America is, and yet that probably is just exactly the opposite. It probably says this is exactly what America is right now. Well, it's been such a strange year. I mean, you have uh, Donald Trump heading the Republican Party ticket, uh, and you have Paul Ryan saying uh, this is the textbook example of a racist comment, his comment about Judge Curiel of Indiana, and Ryan thinking that somehow he can, you know, dip into the well and cleanse himself with indignation, you know, it's just not that easy. You jump into bed with a skunk, you're going to wake up in the morning smelling a little bad, and that's what he's doing. And I think it's horrifying to have a person like Donald Trump as the head of a major party here, as the Republican Party. And I got to salute Reed Ribble, congressman here, Republican in Wisconsin, who has denounced Trump from the very beginning and, and called him a racist this week. And also a shout out to David Blaska, the Dane County board member and conservative iconoclast, irascible old Dave Blaska, who came out with a column this week saying A2 Ryan. So, you know, I think there are real problems, and I think there are going to be a lot of sane, sensible Republican men and self-respecting Republican women who are just not going to be able to vote for this guy. And I think, uh, you know, the best thing going for Hillary Clinton probably is Donald Trump. 
You just gave a textbook answer without mentioning one word in response to my question, <laughs> Matthew. There you go. I should have been a politician. That's what my mom always said. Um, how, did, how the heck did Democrats elect two, uh, nominate two 70-year-old well, white people despite Hillary's gender? Well, look. Hillary Clinton was always going to be a tough candidate. She's always going to be a candidate who was going to be hard to beat because she's paid her dues. She's been working hard her whole life at this. She's very accomplished, Secretary of State, Senator, et cetera. Yep. And the real wild card was Bernie Sanders. I mean, I don't think the, the age thing, though, you know, it would be nice to have another generation of Democrats coming up, another generation of Republicans coming up. Uh, the one thing I thought Scott Walker said that made sense, and I've never agreed with anything Scott Walker said, was that when he got out of the race, other people should have gotten out of the race. I thought Jeb Bush should have gotten out of the race before Iowa, thrown his support to Rubio, tried to uh, make Rubio the candidate. But the real uh, interesting thing on the Democratic side was Bernie Sanders. I mean, he's not a usual politician. I mean, he's a Democratic Socialist. Jewish guy from Vermont, which is a little bit redundant, maybe triply redundant anyway. <laughs> but, but, you know, talking a, a socialist almost winning the nomination of the Democratic Party, that was new. And, and that suggests, and so does Trump, that this is an odd year where people, many people are so angry. Angry at the political system, angry at politics as usual, angry at politicians as usual. And so I think that's what what fueled this. But yeah, the Democrats need another uh, another rank of people coming up a generation below. I think what you've done is you've just described the problem that faces Hillary Clinton because she is not the best candidate the Democrats could have put up. She brings a ton of baggage to this race, which you know the Republicans will use over and over again. Bernie Sanders has siphoned off not just a few voters, tons of voters, millions of voters. And, and while there is probably time that the Clinton campaign needs to use to bring all of them back in the fold, because she will need all of those Sanders voters. It still looks like there's a, a quarter of them that just simply aren't going to budge. So I go back to my point, and that is both Trump and Clinton have a problem driving the base. But you know, here you have an establishment candidate um, who brings, like I said, baggage. And you know, you can shrug off the Benghazi and the email stuff, but the fact is, it's there and it's embedded in the Clinton when people talk about it. I, mean, I agree and, with both and, of those things. And, 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 right. and they're not going to be able to shake it. It's going to be fodder for the debates. Uh, and, you know, Trump has Trump has shown that he could say incredibly stupid things. Uh, he, I mean, things that you would never, ever expect somebody to say and blow them off into the next news cycle. Mm -hmm. That's a problem for the Clinton mm -hmm. campaign because, you know, she has spent the last few weeks, as we've all seen, trying to go after him, trying to, try to lay things on him, call him incompetent. And, and so far, it, it may stick a little bit, but I don't think a whole lot. And, and she's going to have to work doubly hard to not only get her baggage put away and, and, and get people to get off talking about her, but try to make something st stick on Trump. I mean, Clinton's got baggage. Trump's got baggage. I mean, combined, they got more baggage than O'Hare. Right, I right. Mean, this is going to be a, a kind ball, of a crazy season. Air balls and O'Hare. We're, we're rolling. We're rolling here, guys. Now, look, I mean, if I've learned anything from you, too, I think it's the importance of the base. I mean, and I, and, and I get it. Um, but uh, because of the business that I'm in, we, we always look for these side stories. And so this, this generational piece, this idea that young women are struggling to connect with Hillary Clinton, that gender doesn't seem to be the tie. Now, maybe they don't vote. Maybe, maybe, that, maybe that's a non-issue. But I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, I think they voted for Obama, I, you know, and I think that there's a fair number of people who voted for Obama who are not easily drawn to, 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 to Clinton and, and Sanders. And that's an odd dynamic, isn't it? Well, I think a lot of the young women were drawn to Bernie Sanders. Um, and the question is, were that young cohort for Sanders and the principled kind of left-wing progressives for Sanders, are they going to come on board for Hillary? Right. Or are some of them going to either stay home, vote for the Green Party, or just vote down ticket? Yeah. That's the real problem for Hillary with the base. Yeah. Um, all right, I want, I want, I want to kind of move into the down ticket races. Let's, t let's take the last break, and we'll do that when we come back right after this. We're back with Brandon Scholes, who in his day job is partner with the Capital Group, and Matt Rothschild, likewise, executive director of the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign, better known here as the political panel for WISC. Um, 
So Feingold Johnson could actually drive the, the election here in Wisconsin. Yeah, I mean, typically the national parties load in staff and, and offices and they try and help build a ground game. But I think in Wisconsin, uh, based on what happened here in our primary, was Bernie Sanders does very well, Donald Trump didn't do very well. We upset. We were, you know, we were upside down compared to other states. I think it's likely that you will see Ron Johnson, the U.S. Senator, uh, Republican U.S. Senator, and Russ Feingold on the Democrat side be drivers of the turnout. They're, they're the folks with their campaign operations using the infrastructure built in, this, in their political parties could in fact do more to drive voter turnout than just having an election where the presidential candidates drive turnout. I mean, the Republicans have a, an unbelievable infrastructure from the past elections that we've held in the state. I'm not certain that the Democrats have that built as well as demonstrated by some of the races that we've had. So if you look at Ron Johnson, Russ Flagle, they become, they possibly could become the folks that really drive turnout. Not that they would eclipse their presidential nominees in terms of votes, but they may have more of an impact in the state than the presidential candidates well, themselves. Before I ask the, the next, que next question about that, um, are any of the congressional races considered really competitive? Sure. Yeah, yeah the, the open, yeah. open Reed Ribble, Ribble seat. seat. Uh, yeah. Reed Ribble seat, that's yeah, right. That's the Republicans right. have a... A contested aggressive primary, uh, Frank Lassay and Mike Gallagher. Democrats have a primary, but not as much with Tom Nelson. And yeah, that's exact, a, so. yeah. There's, so they're there's going to want they're going to want they're, they're going to want um, um, Feingold Johnson coattails in those in those races. And they they most likely will generate their own turnout strongly as well. I, that's a key that's a key keeper for the Republicans. They can't lose that one. There's a lot of enthusiasm at the base for Russ Feingold wanting to recapture that seat. So I think that's going to help turn out here in Wisconsin. I do think the state may be in play, though. I mean, don't ask me why, but I was watching Fox News earlier this week, and <laughs> they sent a couple reporters to Wisconsin saying if, if Trump can't win Wisconsin, he may not be able to win the White House. And we forget, because Obama won by 200,000 votes each time here, that, that uh, Gore only won by 5,000 votes, right. Kerry won... Wisconsin only by 11,000 votes, so it could be tighter than, than people think, and, and Feingold uh, will maybe help Hillary here. Boy, wouldn't, wouldn't Trump be really lobbying Walker here one of these days to strongly support him? Well, I think, I think the expectation is that Donald Trump would likely want to lobby all the Republican governors yeah. in the states rather than insult them. Um, and and take them down and you know threaten to come back to their states and run for governor. So he hasn't really demonstrated a particularly strong outreach program right now to reach out to those people that he needs to win. I don't I don't see Wisconsin right now as a strong Trump state uh, compared to others. And I guess the question is how much time will he put into it? And and that's one of those things that we could come back two months from now and look at and say. All right, Trump was here six times. He's built the staff. He's done X, Y, and Z, and so he is making a run at the state. But today, I, I don't think that exists. Is there any chance that Paul Ryan's appoint, uh, opponent will even reach a number that would indicate some concern? Well, if he's for Ryan's got, future, I, not necessarily for his election. You know, the, the guy's banking on Sarah Palin and a couple others to really you know, boost his campaign, and he's kind of into theatrics, and I think maybe he fashions himself as somebody who's clever like Donald Trump, and it just doesn't work. I, what, what he misses is how much time Paul Ryan has put into that district. Not as speaker, not as ways and means chair, not as the policy things that he has done, but how much time he has invested in that district, how often he is home, how strong his constituent relations are, his people on the ground work so closely with that community. He's embedded in that community. So when you get a challenger that like like Ryan has, you know, it's fine. This is the process. This is all about primaries and democratic process. But the guy comes to the table with with nothing other than wanting to insult Paul Ryan and, and, and you know, have some, you know, events that he's thinks he's gonna conjure up a campaign. He's been, he's not involved in any fights along the way of issues that we've had in this state, so he thinks he's just going to hitch on to a wagon and, and win an election. Yeah. That's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, legislative stuff, have you, have you even had a chance to dig down, Matt, into yeah, potential bit, stuff uh, here? Yeah, you know, in the state Senate, the Gudex seat is, is up for grabs. Uh, Mark Harris, county exec up there, looks like a strong Democratic candidate. Um, 
Tiffany seat up north. I think some Democrats think Tiffany may be vulnerable, and then they're always hoping for, for uh, Luther Olson's seat or Sheila Harsdorf's seat. I think those are hard nuts to crack, hard seats to fold. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't. They may gain a one or two. Uh, I don't think they're going to flip the Senate. And yeah. so does I mean does the legislative. Do the races even begin to foretell the next gubernatorial campaign? I think if you look at it now on election night, we're going to be looking at the Fox Valley uh -huh. because of, of the state Senate seat, the congressional seat, Ron Johnson's hometown. I think that's going to be a real teller of what happens. But I don't think it produces any changes in the state Senate. Um, I think in the assembly, you may see a few seats switch, not because of any policy issues or or at you know different types of attacks, but maybe more of you know how uh, how balanced those districts are. They're yeah. probably 50-50. So you might see some, but it really depends on that top of the ticket how how Ron Johnson does and and you know what kind of turnout they push. And then finally, I guess for all of these races, we always have to think about what what are the the potentially unexpected influences between now and November and what can you think of them Brandon what 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 might really change things here probably but, depends on what Donald people. Trump says or doesn't say I, I, th I think that is a genuine concern more than the economy or terrorism or any of that you stuff. Know, you, I mean can it, you want people want candidates to talk about the economy talk about jobs to talk about taxes what you're going to do on terrorism I mean, they want serious proposals they don't want lip service uh -huh. or tweets that you know that's not what builds people's confidence in candidates I think voters are going to look for more of that up and down the ticket uh, but what's the thing that comes out I mean you always wonder what happens if there's another terrorist attack or what happens if the economy crashes or one of those October surprises that is not manageable in a 24-hour I mean, news cycle. I'm actually thinking about more Johnson Feingold even than, 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 than yeah, Trump Clinton. I, you know, I, 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 you probably see in the U.S. Senate race a more traditional race of discussion of issues and you know where Ron Johnson has what he has done as, as U.S. Senator certainly the work that he's doing on on Tolman the vets is a big issue certainly there's going to be a look back on Russ Feingold's record of what he did so it is more of a we traditional just, race we just ran out of time well we're gonna be back we'll be back in a few weeks we'll wrap it up right after this my thanks my thanks to Brandon Scholes and Matt Rothschild and we'll all be back and we'll see you next week on for the record